So let us continue our discussion of adiabatic processes. So what exactly is an adiabatic process? An adiabatic process is a process in which there is no change in energy as a result of heat. So no energy flows into our system or out of our system as a result of a difference in temperature between the system and the surroundings. Once again, in any adiabatic process, the energy transfer as a result of heat is assumed to be zero. Now recall that according to the first law of thermodynamics, the change in internal energy of our gas system, ideal gas system, is equal to the amount of energy that flows into our system as a result of heat minus the work done by the system on the surroundings. Now because we're dealing with an adiabatic process, the Q is zero and that implies that in any adiabatic expansion or compression of an ideal gas, the change in internal energy of that system is equal to negative of the work done by the system on the surroundings. Now, what this equation basically implies is, if the internal energy of our gas system increases, that means that work is done by the surroundings on the system. And likewise, if the internal energy of our system decreases, work is done by the system on the surroundings. Now, we can also plot an adiabatic process on the x-y axis. So let's suppose the x-axis is the volume and the y-axis is the pressure. We see that in any adiabatic expansion, as the volume increases, the pressure decreases. And as the volume in, uh, decreases, the pressure will increase. So the pressure and the volume in any adiabatic process changes. What about the temperature? Does the temperature in an adiabatic process change? Well, notice that in any adiabatic process, there is a change in internal energy. And that means that there is also a change in temperature. So not only does pressure and volume change, the temperature is also allowed to change in an adiabatic expansion. What doesn't change is Q. The Q is always zero in any adiabatic expansion or compression of gas. Now, let's try to answer the following question. What is the relationship between the pressure and the volume in any adiabatic expansion or compression of an ideal gas, assuming that our expansion or compression is very slow? So we basically want to derive an equation that gives us a relationship between the pressure and the volume. So let's begin by assuming that our volume expands or compresses by an infinitely small amount. So that means if we look at the first law of thermodynamics, we get the following result. When there is an expansion or compression by infinitely small change, uh, infinitely small quantity in an adiabatic expansion, that means there is an infinitely small change in internal energy. So dE internal is equal to infinitely small change in Q minus infinitely small change in W, the work and our heat. Now because we're dealing with an adiabatic expansion, or compression, that implies that our dq is zero. So we get the following result. The infinitely small change in internal energy is equal to the negative of the infinitely small change in work that is done by the system on the surroundings. Now recall that work is equal to force times displacement. So that means we go from this quantity to this quantity. So, we have negative dW is equal to negative the force multiplied by infinitely small change displacement. Now, force itself is equal to the pressure times the area. So, that means we can replace the force with P times A. So, we have our infinitely small change in internal energy of our system is equal to negative P times A uh, multiplied by dL. 
Now, A multiplied by DL is simply infinitely small change in volume because the area multiplied by the height gives us the volume. So we see that our infinitely small change in internal energy is equal to the negative of the pressure multiplied by the infinitely small change in volume. And let's call this equation number one. Now, because we're dealing with a monatomic ideal gas, that means that the change in internal energy is equal to the following equation. And this equation is equal to N, the number of moles, multiplied by CV, the molar specific heat of our reaction, in which the volume is assumed to be constant, multiplied by the change in temperature. Now, that means because this quantity is equal to this quantity, we see that an infinitely small change in our internal energy is equal to the product of N multiplied by the molar, speci uh, molar specific heat multiplied by infinitely small change in dT. So, we essentially call this equation 2 and now we combine equation 1 with equation 2. We combine them, we combine them in the following manner. Because DE internal is equal to this and this is equal to the same DE internal, that means we say we equate equation 1 to equation 2. So we have negative of P multiplied by dV is equal to N multiplied by the molar specific heat multiplied by dT. So we bring this to the right side and we set it equal to zero. And we call this equation three. Now, once again, in our adiabatic expansion, the pressure, the volume, and the temperature are allowed to vary. So because P, V, and T vary in any adiabatic process, we can take the differential of the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law states that the pressure multiplied by the volume is equal to N multiplied by R multiplied by T. So we take the differential with respect to each one of these variables and we get the following differential equation. So P multiplied by dV plus V multiplied by dP is equal to NR multiplied by dT. Now, remember, initially, we said we want to derive an equation that relates the pressure and the volume. We don't want to worry about the temperature. So that means we can take this equation, solve for dt. So we get the following result. So we essentially divide both sides by n divided by n multiplied by r. So we see that the infinitely small change in t, uh, dt is equal to this ratio. Now, we can take equation 3 and we can combine it with equation 4 to get rid of the dt term. So we substitute equation 4 into equation 3. So we have P multiplied by dV plus N times the molar specific heat multiplied by dt. But dt is equal to this ratio. And that's exactly what we do in this case. Now notice the ends appear on top and bottom so we can cancel these ends these ends disappear and we multiply both sides by r the universal gas constant so this is multiplied by r and we get r multiplied by p multiplied by dv and this is multiplied by r notice the r appears on top and bottom so the r's cancel the ends cancel and we're left with cvp multiplied by dv plus CVV multiplied by DP. Now, if we multiply the other side by R, well, 0 times R is simply 0. Now, notice this term and this term, they both have the same common term, P multiplied by DV. So we can take that out and we get the following result. R plus CV multiplied by PDV plus this term CVV multiplied by DP and this is equal to zero. Now, in a previous lecture when we spoke about the molar specific heat, we were able to show that CP is equal to R 
plus CV. So we can rewrite this equation in the following way. So R plus CV is simply equal to CP. So this becomes CP and we have the following result. CP multiplied by P multiplied by DV plus CV multiplied by V multiplied by DP is equal to zero. So the CP is simply the molar specific heat when the pressure is constant and the CV is simply the molar specific heat when the volume is constant. So let's divide both sides by CV. So the CV from this term will cancel and we're left with CP divided by CV. Let's also divide both sides by the product of P and V and we get the following result. The ratio of CP divided by CV multiplied by DV divided by V plus DP divided by P is equal to zero. So now we take this and we integrate it and we get the following result. CP divided by CV multiplied by natural log of V plus natural log of P is equal to some constant, some unknown constant. Now, if we use the laws of logs, we get the following rearranged result. So, the pressure multiplied by the volume raised to the power of CP divided by CV is equal to some constant.